What makes us God's people? We can ask a similar question, what, uh, what makes us Canadian? And certainly there's a lot of national pride around this time, around Remembrance Day, as we think of our, our veterans and what they did on our behalf, really what they've done, um, not just for us, but actually on the, for the benefit of many others, fighting in the world wars. Of course, Korea, we can think of peacekeeping missions, uh, just our veterans have, have done so much really for, for other nations as well as for ourselves. So, so we have some national pride when it comes to thinking of the Canadian military and our veterans. We might also have a bit of national pride with the recent election in, in the States, uh, where in the time it took the States, um, it's taken the States to figure out who the president is. Well, our, our prime minister would already be back to work, or if we had a new prime minister, You'd already be getting to work by now. Uh, so we might have a bit of national pride about our, our simpler uh, political system, it would seem. Uh, whatever pride we have as Canadians, we can ask the question, well, what makes us Canadians? And how, what does a Canadian look like? Is it the fact that we live in Canada? Well, not necessarily, because I can think of people who are Canadian who are living not in Canada. And I can also think of people who are living in Canada who would say, no, I'm not Canadian. So that's not it. Uh, maybe it's um, the language we speak. Uh, but although I can think of people who are Canadians who don't speak either English or French. Uh, so that's not it. Maybe it's our accent. Although I know many Canadians uh, don't have a Canadian accent, eh? Uh, or maybe it's the fact that uh, we watch hockey, eh? Maybe that's it. Um, is that, or, or maybe we can say, well, I'm true Canadian and I cheer for the Maple Leafs. Is that it? Uh, I don't think that that's it. What, what is it? And we can ask the same question about God's people. What makes us God's people? There were those in the days of the early church, the early Christians, who thought they knew the answer to that. And their answer to that was quite simple. Well, this is what God's people look like is that we follow the Old Testament covenant, we have the customs that are laid down in the Old Testament, uh, we follow all the festivals that are laid down in the Old Testament, we, and these customs, by the way, include circumcision uh, for the male boys, and um, so there's these customs and all these things and all these rules and regulations that we follow, that makes us, uh, that's, that makes us God's people. This extends even to our diet and the things that we eat and the things that we will not eat. Uh, and things like this, and also dress, and, uh, and all kinds of things like that. And so some people would say, we know exactly what uh, makes us God's people. It's these things. Well, it was a big question back in the early days of, of people coming to know Jesus and coming to faith in Christ. And it was a big question. In fact, there was a, a council held in Jerusalem. The apostles came together and a lot of the early Christians came together to really hammer out this question and, and, and figure it out. And let's take a look at that for a moment in Acts chapter 15. And there we'll find that uh, uh, here is the conclusion to it. After much prayerful thinking through it, they, they come to this. And this is a letter that they send out uh, to all all the Christians, and especially those who are becoming Christians from, from other places who aren't of a Jewish background. And here's what they say. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And notice there's a, a wonderful working together there of, uh, of, of having God's input on this. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from these things, you will do well, farewell. That's very short, sweet, and to the point. Um, what, what does it look like to be God's people? Well, it certainly doesn't look like having to follow now all these customs and regulations and fit in really to the subculture of Judaism. Uh, you, in other words, they're saying you don't have to become Jewish in order now to, to be part of God's people. That's not it. Uh, but rather you do. Uh, you will want to center and focus your life on Jesus now. And that's what it's getting about there when it says uh, about abstaining from, from blood and, and meat sacrificed to idols and, and from strangle, uh, strangled things and from and from sexual impurity there, as it speaks about those things, it's really speaking about the worship lives of many Romans. In other words, you can't, you can't worship all these gods in the way you used to and also worship Christ. It's, it's one or the other. It's you worship Christ now. 
and so all these other things you need to put away. So you don't need to become Jewish, but neither can you just remain Roman in the way that you were. There's a new life ahead of you, and it's focused on Christ. And so that was the, the decision there that came through the early church and God's blessing. And however, there were still people going around the early Christians saying, no, if you are God's people, then you must look like us. Because after all, we are the righteous ones. In other words, we are the ones who have right standing before God because we follow his, his covenant, his old covenant. However, you are not righteous ones because you do not do the right thing and you do not have right standing before God. Uh, so they're really going around the early Christians trying to stir this up. And Paul knows this. And so he sends as part of his letter to Philippians that we've been looking through, he sends as part of this letter, a really strong encouragement. And notice how strong it is here. And uh, let's go back to chapter three, verse one there. To write the same things to you is not troublesome to me, uh, for, but for you, it is a safeguard. So it's, in other words, listen up, this is important. Beware of the dogs. Now, if that sounds like a bit of a slur, <laughs> it is. Uh, dogs were unclean animals to the Jewish mind. And so sometimes that could be a slur from a Jewish person to a non-Jewish person. Um, you dog, you know, you're uncircumcised, you unclean. Uh, so Paul's really flipping that on his head here, and it's really a bit snarky, isn't it? Uh, beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. In other words, again, we are, we are the ones who work good, uh, who do good works, who follow the old covenant, uh, some of the Jewish people would say. And here Paul is like, beware of those who are actually, well, they think they're doing good, but maybe they're not in this case. Uh, beware of those who mutilate the flesh. That's an obvious reference to circumcision there. For it is we who are the circumcision, who worship in the spirit of God and boast in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. In other words, we put no confidence in the fact that, uh, well, some, some are circumcised and they say, that shows that I'm part of God's people. And Paul's like, no, that's not it. That's not, that's not how, how God's people look at this time now that we are under a new covenant, now that we are in Jesus. And so he'll go on to say, actually, that if anybody can take pride in looking Jewish, it's me, Paul. And notice what he says here. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. In other words, if anybody has confidence in these things you can point out to, to say, look, I'm, God's pe I'm part of God's people. Paul is like, no, I have, I have it even more. Circumcised on the eighth day in, in verse five there, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Paul is like, if you're gonna look at these things and say that's what it takes to be, uh, to be a, somebody who's part of God's people, well, then I can boast of that stuff. I, amongst all of you, I'm it. I'm what God's people look like, if that's the case. But here's the point. That's not what it looks like. That's not how it works anymore. Uh, so what does it look like now? While well, we go on in verses seven and following. Yet whatever gains I had, these I've come to regard as loss because of Christ. And he's speaking of financial terms here of profit and loss, uh, that things that he might be put to his account to say, yes, I am in God's people, uh, part of God's people. Well, actually now, no, it hasn't helped at all. Uh, more than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Knowing Christ Jesus, that's, what it looks like to be God's people. Who are God's people? Those who know Jesus Christ. He goes on, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and I regard them as rubbish. The word rubbish there, that's kind of a, a nice way to put it. It's, it's, it's really a lot stronger than that. It's basically excrement, it's basically poop. <laughs> I consider it all poop in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. That's what God's people look like. People who are found in Christ. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, 
but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. And this is an interesting verse here. If you've ever been part of a Bible study that I've left, you've, that I've led, you've probably heard me say on many occasions, uh, you cannot translate the scriptures without interpreting as you go. And, so, and we need to pray for those who translate scriptures. It's a very important task, and it can be a difficult task sometimes. Sometimes you have to make a, a judgment call as to, to how to understand a passage in order to translate it. You can't just translate it word for word. That, that just doesn't work. But here we have an issue of translation here in that whose faith is it here? And we typically, sometimes we come at it with our theology already built and therefore we interpret uh, according to where our theology ra is, rather than actually looking at the scripture and being open to, to what it actually means. So verse nine here, and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ. So that makes it look sound like our faith, our righteousness comes from our faith in Christ. But actually, that can be translated this way, that uh, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that one that comes from the faith of Christ. In other words, the faithfulness of Christ. And looking to the obedience of Christ, who, who did not consider equality of God, with God as something to be exploited, but rather became, uh, humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's the faithfulness of Christ to what God had called him to do. We can look at the faithfulness of Christ there. And so that's where Paul is finding his righteousness here, his right standing with God, in other words. In, in other words, the, the, the fact that makes him one of God's people isn't his own righteousness from being able to follow the old covenant, but rather is through the righteousness of Christ, what Christ had done for him, the obedience of Christ on the cross. That's where Paul now knows that he has a right standing before God, that he has a righteousness. That's where his righteousness is. That's what God's people look like. Those who have been made righteous through the faithfulness of Christ. That's where it comes from. And so he goes on to say, I want to know Christ. So to sum up what Paul has said in all that, he's like, if there's any, such a thing as a person who looks like God's people, if you define it according to the old covenant and the customs and practices of, of, of the old covenant people, then I'm it. I'm the model of what, what that looks like. But he's like, that's not it. That's not how God relates to us now. Now in Christ, God relates to us through the faithfulness of Christ the obedience of Christ to death on the cross. That's how God relates to us now. That's, that's what makes us God's people now, is Christ's faithfulness. So what are the lessons that we can learn from this? What are some practical things that we can learn that should instruct us uh, moving forward? Well, one thing we can notice is how, how easy it was for God's old covenant people, the Jewish people, to, to actually be, well, the term is Judaizers, uh, encouraging those who are coming to, to faith in God through Christ to become Jewish. And the reason why that was so easy to take that, that view of things was because Christianity is so enmeshed in Judaism. You see, here's what often happens, is that we often think of Christianity as being a completely separate thing from Judaism. Uh, we, we sometimes even think of it as plan B, as if God tried plan A with the Jewish people and that didn't work out so well. So let's go to plan B, let's send Jesus and we'll do it differently. That's not it at all. Jesus Christ and, and all that has come from Jesus and the new covenant, that's not plan B. That's the continuation of plan A. And so those coming to, to faith in Jesus from the Jewish perspective, they could see that. And so how easy it was for them to say, well, okay, now that this is open for non-Jewish people to become, uh, to come to God through Jesus Christ, okay, that's fine. They come to us, they come under our umbrella of Judaism because it's just an extenuation. Uh, this is God fulfilling the promises he made to us, all the hopes and dreams that he instilled in us in the Old Covenant, in the, in the Old Testament. Uh, all, all of that has come about through Jesus now. So it really is a continuation. It's not a new religion that Jesus started, but rather this is the next step 
uh, that, that God has for us. So, so how easy it was for them with the enmeshment of Judaism and Christianity together. And we, we sometimes have, uh, do a, a bad thing in, in splitting the two apart, wide apart and saying that, um, that, that Christianity is really a new religion. It was not. It's the continuation actually of, of the Jewish program. And so, so the Old Testament is very, very important to us as Christians. And it's really, really bad when we say things like, Mm, don't like the Old Testament God who was cruel, but we do like the New Testament God who was kind. Ah, that is, that is not a good reading of the Old Testament. Go, we need to go back and read it again and watch for the, the compassion of God in the Old Testament. Watch for the promises of God in the Old Testament that lead through to what happens in the New Testament and also lead to the great and wonderful things that happen in the Old Testament too. Uh, so we want to be careful that we don't try to split off Christianity and talk about it as a new religion, as if Christ founded it, or as if the followers of Jesus founded Christianity. Not at all. It was the next step of plan A of what God was doing all along. So that's one thing. We want to keep that in mind. Well, here's the, the second lesson we might learn from this. And it's uh, just an interesting encouragement to, to, to think about how we do evangelism. There's a curious verse here, and maybe you picked up on it as, as it was read. And here's as Paul is saying how he's got the marks of God's people, if you're looking at it as, as, as having all the good marks of being a good old covenant person. And here he says, I'm a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Notice that, blameless. Doesn't that make you kind of scratch your head and say, well, wait a minute, Paul, didn't you say back in Romans chapter three, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And didn't you quote the Old Testament back in Romans chapter three, which says, uh, there is no one righteous, no, not one. So aren't you included in that? And I think Paul, if we could speak to him, would say, yes, absolutely, I'm included in that. That yes, there, how, there is sin in my life, things like attitude, things like my character. Um, that, yeah, there is sin in my life. But when it comes to keeping the customs and the obligations and the rules that we find in the old covenant, as far as that stuff goes, actually, I was blameless. I did it great. I did it very well. And that's interesting. Because that can make us think about those who will say, I'm a good person. And I don't know about you, but I've discovered that there are some people who do not claim to be Christians who live very good Christian lives. Have you noticed that? There are some people who don't claim to be Christian in any way, and yet they're good people with good morals and good ethics even, which by the way, I'd say comes from Christianity as our, our culture has been marinating in Christianity for a long time. So a lot of people pick up Christian ethics and values even without knowing they're doing it. But I can think of a lot of non-Christians I've met who are good people. And I can think of Christians I've met too who are not good people. So what's going on there? Well, again, what is it that marks us out as being God's people? According to Paul, it's not this idea of being able to sh point to your own blamelessness. And we have a habit of saying to anybody that says, oh, I'm, I'm a good person. We have this habit of saying, well, no, you're not, and trying to prove that they're not. And, and actually, I think this is how the Christian message comes across to non-Christians sometimes. It's as if the, the message can be netted down to this, that you, oh, non-Christian person, are pathetic and horrible. But by the way, Jesus loves you anyway. I think that's what sometimes people hear the message as being. Maybe the message should sound more like this. Jesus is Lord. His kingdom has come and he invites you to be a part of his kingdom. In fact, he invites you to be, God invites you to be part of his family, no matter how good you think you may or may not be. And by the way, we've all fallen short of the glory of God somehow. We all have, but he invites you to participate in his kingdom, to be in his family, and he will send his Holy Spirit into you to, to help you walk with Jesus, uh, to grow in him, to have your character changed. Maybe we need to rethink how we do evangelism. 
Sometimes it sounds like we're spending all our energy trying to prove to people how bad they are. Maybe our energy should be spent showing people how good God is. So that's the second thing is uh, it's a lesson there on evangelism, just picking up on that Paul saying, I'm blameless, and that's interesting. But here's the third thing. As we think about what makes us God's people, just the question, am I really one of God's people? And what is it makes me one of God's people? Is it that I've taken up religion? Well, actually, that's not it. Is it that I've gone through the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament, and figured out a lot of rules, and I keep them well? Is that what makes me one of God's people? Well, again, Paul would say I would consider that to be rubbish. That's not it. Is it that I've looked at Christian subculture and I've been able to fit into it? So I've seen how Christians dress, and I've started dressing that way. I've seen the kind of Christian, the haircuts Christians have, and I've got, I've, I've got my haircut the same. I've listened to how Christians talk, and now I'm talking the same way. I've looked at their customs, and I'm following their customs. Is that it? And by the way, which Christian subculture is it that you'd want to fit in with, if that is it? Indeed, that's not it either. All these things that we've just mentioned, it's all rubbish compared to knowing Jesus. It's rubbish compared to being found in him. It's rubbish compared to having the righteousness of Christ. His faithfulness making us righteous. In other words, that we stand in the right place. That we stand amongst the people of God. Not because of us, but because of Jesus Christ. What makes, what makes us God's people? It's Jesus. Do you belong to God's people? 